Well, good morning. You can turn in your copy of God's Word to Ephesians chapter 6. We'll be in verses 10 through 20 this morning. Uh, thank you to Boyce Worship Collective for leading us, including having my colleague Dr. Doe here on the, on the stage as well. It's always a joy to be led in song from you guys. I appreciate that. Uh, five years in, I still feel like I uh, will be pinched and woken up from getting to serve uh, our churches by serving you students with uh, these colleagues in this place. It really is an incredible blessing uh, to get to be here, uh, one that I don't take for granted. So uh, as we gather this morning, as we gather to begin to think about Ephesians 6, uh, maybe you've heard uh, people in certain corners of the evangelical space uh, say something like, uh, person so-and-so, leader so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, they just don't know what time it is, right? They just don't know what time it is. Now, when someone makes that criticism of someone, obviously they don't mean that they forgot to charge their Apple watch, right? They don't mean that they left their watch at home. What they mean is that they are fundamentally failing to understand that the current moment in which we find ourselves in as it relates to culture and society has transitioned from one to acceptance and even support for Christians to one of controversy and even disdain for Christians and the church, right? It's what is meant by this criticism when we say that someone doesn't know what time it is. And I think we'd largely say this is true, right? That the, the church and the Christian faith has, has shifted in this way in terms of how the culture sees us. And that's important to know. I recently even heard Dr. Moeller say in a different context that one responsibility of leaders is to help people know what time it is. And I agree with that. In fact, I've read several books, even over the last few years that try to do this, right? I, and kind of one of my favorite genres is trying to go back in, in church history and tell us, you know, which era of church history is most like our moment. And so I've read books that, that compare us to the second century when the church is being persecuted by pagans and books that compare us to the sixth through eighth centuries when the barbarians are invading uh, Europe. And even uh, this week, I read a book where we're being compared to uh, what Augustine of Hippo is facing in the fourth and fifth century where Christianity is just one option among a few competing options. All right. <laughs> and while understanding our cultural moment is something that's very worthwhile, while we do need to know what time it is in this way, I think that as Christians, there is a, a greater danger of failing to understand in an even more profound way what time it is as it relates to God's ultimate timeline, right? If we understand the cultural moment in which we are in rightly, but fail to understand that we live in this time in between the times, what Paul would call in, in Galatians for this present evil age, then we fail to understand an even more basic concept. And so this morning, I want to answer the question, what time is it by talking about this present evil age and how we are as the church, as Christians to live in this time between the time by looking to Ephesians 6. Now, as you likely know, we uh, this present evil age is sort of characterized by this moment that we're in that is following the incarnation and the earthly ministry of Christ, right? We think about his, his obedient life, his death on the cross for our sins, his resurrection and ascension. All that's happened, right? This already of the kingdom has broken forth, but now we live after that, but yet we await the final return of our king who will make all things new, right? When he triumphs in glory over every enemy who would contend against his kingdom. And 
the fundamental thing about living in this age that I want us to understand this morning is that where we sit on God's ultimate timeline is not a time of peace, but of war. It's not a time of peace, but it's a time of war. As the church, as Christians, right, we should love peace. We should hope for peace. We should pray for peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. But brothers and sisters, I want to remind you, lest we fool ourselves into thinking that we are currently at peace, that to be at peace with God is to be at war with the devil. To be at peace with God is to be at war with the devil. Now, I know that some people may not like this language anymore, and there are good arguments to be made, but I I still think that the language of a militant and a triumphant church and the distinction made there can be helpful. The, The militant church is the church that sits in this current, present evil age that's engaged in a sort of holy warfare. This is how Burkhoff would put it. It says, she, meaning the church, must be engaged with all her might in the battles of her Lord, fighting in a war that is both offensive and defensive. If the church on earth is the militant church, the church in heaven is the triumphant church. There, the sword is exchanged for the palm of victory. Now, friends, I long for the day where the sword gets exchanged for the palm of victory. I long for that day. I pray for that day. But that day is not yet. That's not the day in which we live. If we're to be faithful soldiers of Christ right now, we are serving in a church that is very much militant. But we must wage that war rightly. We can't wage that war recklessly. And so this morning, I want us to spend some time in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. And I believe that we can point to several key truths in this passage that will help us in this task of waging war rightly, even as we await the return of our triumphant king. So join me in Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning for your spirit to strengthen us so that we may serve as faithful soldiers for you. Father, help us to gain clarity over what it means to wage war rightly in a way that brings glory to you and serves a lost and dying world. Father, open your word by your spirit to us and strengthen us. In Christ's name, amen. Now, victory or defeat in warfare can come down to a lot of things, right? You can Battle plans left on a battlefield, a lot of things. But perhaps nothing is more essential than having a good strategy, right? possessing a good strategy. And there have been a lot of poor strategies in the history of warfare. But since I'm now, you know, kind of entering middle age, 
and I, I couldn't find a way to fit like smoked meat in here as an analogy or example that would work. You can have to bear with me for a World War II analogy, right? Because obviously I love both of these things. Um, now, perhaps the most strategic failure in, in the history of warfare uh, is the failure of the strategy of appeasement that was associated with Neville Chamberlain in the years leading up to Britain's involvement in World War II, right? Uh, it's easy to understand why following on the heels of World War I uh, that, that they would want to hold this strategy, but, but Prime Minister Chamberlain thought that he could possibly prevent war by holding this policy of appeasement, of appeasement against Hitler and Nazi Germany as they were making inroads throughout continental Europe. Appeasement just involves sort of continuing to make concessions after concession to prevent war. So in this case, um, as history bore out and as one Winston Churchill rightly saw, there was no strategy of appeasement that would ever be successful against a tyrant who is bent on making war in order to conquer you even at the expense of millions of lives and on your own soil. And so in a famous speech, after uh, it was sort of understood by everyone that this strategy of appeasement was, was not going to work and Winston Churchill had been made the prime minister uh, in this famous speech, this is what Churchill said related to his strategy. He says, what General Wagan called the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we've known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will say, this was their finest hour. You see, what Churchill understood that Chamberlain had failed to comprehend was that the only strategy against such a powerful and determined enemy was a strategy of total war. A total war. And brothers and sisters, in this present and evil age, we are no less engaged in total war. The right strategy against the powers of darkness must not and cannot include appeasement. Concessions can never be made. No ground can be offered. And if we are to engage in a spiritual version of total war, I think Ephesians 6 highlights a couple of necessary elements. First, to wage war rightly requires that we draw our strength, our power from the Lord. Right? Beginning here in verse 10, he writes, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And the form of this verb here that we translate be strong or perhaps be strengthened indicates very clearly that there, this is a power source that is not from within, but an external power source to us, namely our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, any strategy that depends on the strength of even the strongest Christian believer will fail. But if you are drawing your strength from the Lord Jesus Christ, who's already defeated every power of darkness, then you cannot lose. Only the strength of Christ will provide the power that we need to engage in spiritual warfare. F.F. F. Bruce, uh, no relation, unfortunately, uh, channeling John Owen, writes this. He says, the Christian soldier must not dream of entering on the spiritual warfare at his own charges or with his own equipment. Let him cry with David, it is God that girdeth me with strength. He teacheth my hands to war. His resources must be procured from headquarters, not self-devised. We that can do nothing in ourselves, for we are such weaklings, 
can do all things in Christ as giants. The Lord's power. Second, the right strategy involves not just power, but our posture. Paul says here in verse 10, and we'll continue on several times in, throughout this passage, to stand, to stand against the st- schemes of the devil. The, the idea here is to stand firm, to, to hold your ground, to not be pushed around, to not be pushed back by these dark forces. Now, how many of us can say in, in the Lord's strength that today we are standing firm against the schemes of the devil? My fear is that as Christians, we can often uh, be caught dancing with the devil rather than standing against him. What does this look like? I think Ephesians 4 helps us out. It involves a, a putting off of the old self and a putting on of the new. Friends, if you're giving yourselves over to the ungodly anger, to the lying, to the stealing, to the unwholesome talk, to the unforgiveness, all of these things that characterize the old way of life and you're failing to to put on uh, the new self, then you're probably not standing, you're probably getting pushed around. Brothers and sisters, the devil is hell-bent on destroying the witness and the strength of every believer. He's engaging in total warfare against you. And you nor I can can afford to allow him to gain any sort of foothold in our lives. And so I ask you, are you standing in the strength of the Lord, firm against the devil today? Or if you could play back the, the words that you've spoken or the words that you've entered into a search bar, or shared on a direct message, or the images that you've consumed, or the things that have been, you've been dwelling on in your mind, would they in fact reveal that you're doing anything but standing? We can't afford a strategy that involves anything less than total war, empowered by God and standing firm against the forces of evil. It brings me to my, my second point. Look carefully from verse 12 that we must recognize the right enemy. Just recognize the right enemy. Recently, I, I was listening to a, uh, a, Viet, a Vietnam veteran recount his experience on what was called a SOG team. Now, if you're not familiar with the SOG team, uh, these were the elite of the elite. And they would, uh, during this war, uh, they would go on some of the most dangerous missions imaginable, often well beyond uh, enemy lines and even into other foreign territories. And one thing that stood out uh, from from this interview that I was hearing with this this soldier who had served on this SOG team was he mentioned that they could enter the dense jungles of, of Vietnam and they could smell whether or not someone who is even a decent ways away from them in the jungle was an enemy or an ally. They could could smell it. And this was based on the fact that the the North Vietnamese had a slightly different diet than the South Vietnamese. And over time, they were able to pick up those differences, even with their sense of smell. And of course, what a help. Because in the fog of war, you've got to know who is your enemy. And in verse 12, Paul makes clear who our enemy is and who our enemy isn't. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We know who the enemy is not. Now, Let's be clear, there is human opposition to the gospel and the church and the Christian faith, right? There's human opposition to it. But human opposition in the weakness and frailty do not represent the ultimate opposition that we face. Flesh and blood do not represent our ultimate enemies. I hate to tell you, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. If our enemies were flesh and blood, we 
would know how to handle them. We could do that in our own strength, but that's not what characterizes our enemies. No, we need supernatural power because we face a supernatural enemy. But if you are like me, sometimes it's easy to forget that people who are actively opposing the gospel are not the ultimate enemies. It's easy to get frustrated, to get angry, to uh, fail to recognize that there's a more powerful enemy who's behind that flesh and blood opponent. Calvin commenting on these verses said this, I think is very helpful. It says, by flesh and blood, the apostle denotes men who are so denominated in order to contrast them with spiritual assailants. This is no bodily struggle. Then he says this, let us remember this when the injurious treatment of others provokes us to revenge. Our natural disposition would lead us to direct all our exertions against the men themselves. But this foolish desire will be restrained by the consideration that the men who annoy us are nothing more than darts thrown by the hand of Satan. While we are employed in destroying those darts, we lay ourselves open to be wounded on all sides. To wrestle with flesh and blood will not only be useless, but highly pernicious. We must go straight to the enemy who attacks and wounds us from his concealment before he appears. If we're going to wage war rightly, we have to maintain focus on the right enemy. And again, it's not to say that satanic opposition to the gospel doesn't present itself in human form. But it is to say that every flesh and blood opponent of the gospel is also an opportunity for the gospel. Augustine would remind us, he says, we have to distinguish between enemies for whom we pray and enemies against whom we pray. Human enemies of whatever kind are not to be hated. The enemies against whom we need to pray are the devil and his angels. Every flesh and blood opponent of the gospel is also an opportunity for the gospel. But if we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, who do we wrestle with? Well, I will tell you that there's a lot of ink that's been spilled on exactly what's meant by these four clauses here. Uh, and so I'm just gonna sum it up like this. Our real enemies are wicked supernatural beings under the direction of Satan, right? We face real supernatural beings who serve under the direction of Satan to create as much wickedness and mischief in this world that they can. And yeah, they exist beyond this earthly plane, but they cause destruction within this earthly plane. Friends, we have to have supernatural power to wage, up against, ways to wage war against this supernatural enemy. And then to our third point, we also need the right weaponry. If we have the right strategy, we're aiming at the right enemy, then we need the right weaponry. And Paul summarizes this in verse 13 when he says, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. The whole armor of God that you may stand. Notice the, the continued uh, em emphasis on standing. Also, uh, this evil day, I think what is meant here is that uh, we live in this present evil age where there's consistent opposition to the gospel, but there are also moments in time where for whatever reason, satanic forces are channeled to provide you uh, with an unusual challenge, to present you with a uh, heightened sense of spiritual warfare meant to destroy you. Like the workers who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah, we must labor day in and day out, but constantly armed for battle. And thankfully, we're given some very specific weapons. Paul tells us, take up, a, it can be translated put on, right? It's, it's put on the armor of God. 
We must resist going to war in Saul's worldly armor and we must be content with the armor that the Lord has given us. And I, I wish that I had a lot of time to look at each piece mentioned here. I would, I would point you to a couple of places. The, the Puritan William Gurnall has a classic text called The Christian in Complete Armor that goes through this. Um, if you want something that doesn't require wheels to transport, uh, you could check out um, The Whole Armor of God by Ian Duggard. And those are helpful expositions of this passage. I can only uh, do a bit here, but I, I do want us to spend some time going through it. First, Paul speaks of the belt of truth, right? The belt of truth. Now, likely in view here is a, a sort of apron that would be worn under the armor, it would protect your thighs, uh, even from the armor and from attack. And uh, <clears throat> to fasten on, right, the belt of truth is to fasten around your waist, uh, both, I believe, the truth of the gospel and a life lived consistent with that truth. Right? We are to fasten on both uh, the truth of God as well as a life that corresponds, not perfectly of course, but very consistently with that truth. Lies fall prey to truth. The devil is a liar. And so the father of lies can only be defeated by truth. Truth proclaimed and truth lived out. So we must always resist to respond to the devil's lies with more lies. You never win if you play the devil's game. Second, we read of the breastplate of righteousness. And this would have referred to a, a piece of sort of body armor that you would have placed sort of over your chest and likely over your back that would have protected your, your most vital organs. Similar to, to truth, I think you can see a kind of twofold meaning here as this piece of armor relates to righteousness, right? Certainly we, we place on an understanding that we have been declared righteous in God's sight, that because of the work of Christ, uh, no accusation leveled against us will stand because we have been declared by God righteous in his sight on behalf uh, or in, in due to the work of Christ. But we also put on an, an ethical righteousness that we, we live a life committed to following Christ, to imitate him, to uh, living ethically in this world as Christ would have us to. And when we fail to do that, then we open up our most vital organs to devastating blows from Satan. Let's put on the breastplate of righteousness. Next, we move to footwear. Footwear is important. The older you get, the more it will be important. Um, it says this, is, and it, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Uh, he seems to be referencing likely Isaiah 52, 7, where he says, where Isaiah writes, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Romans took their footwear very seriously. Paul could likely see this sort of half boot that the Roman soldiers would wear as he's even writing this passage. And this boot was carefully constructed so that a Roman soldier could be quick to respond to any sort of challenge, right? You could be quick to action, but it also gave a lot of support so that on a long march, you, you, your, uh, your feet would hold up, that you would not uh, fall prey to uh, damage to your feet. This was important. I, if, I'm just gonna say, if you come to my house, you'll learn that I take footwear pretty seriously. I do. And so, you know, when my girls are going outside to ride a bike or if we're going somewhere, I'm just always preaching a message of closed-toed shoes. I just am. They'll tell you. I, I was like, you, you should probably wear closed-toed shoes, you know. And it's just, I just, like, I care about them. I love them. I don't want them to hurt their feet. Footwear is important. It just is. But similar, it's important here. 
Like the messenger of Isaiah, we must be ready to preach the gospel of peace at any moment, even while ready to leap into combat against the spiritual forces of darkness. Fourth, Paul introduces us to the shield of faith. This shield in view here, is, it's not a small shield, but it's, it's a large shield that could protect your whole body from darts and arrows that are raining down from the evil one. It would have likely been covered in leather and soaked in water before battle so that any flaming darts and arrows would, would extinguish in the water. Now, on Friday night, uh, the conclusion of our Boys College Spirit Week, we had a little something that we call hall ball. If you don't know what hall ball is, it is when we gather in a large cage as different uh, halls and we compete by throwing dodgeballs at one another. The, the halls are uh, given the opportunity to invite sort of faculty and staff to participate with them. And I had the privilege of serving on Petros. Now, when I got, when I, you know, after we're, we're heading home and my, my wife just said, you know, I, th- I, I, th- I noticed that your strategy this year was just kind of to hang behind the girls <laughs> and, and use them as a shield until you could get off a good shot. And, and now, I, while I must say that was not my intentional strategy, Upon some reflection, I see where she's coming from. And so I think I need to apologize to the girls of Petros if I used you as a human shield on a hall ball Friday night. (laughs) Shield is a very effective piece of armor. And in this context, the shield of faith is meant to protect us not from dodgeballs, but from slanderous accusations of Satan. When he rains down conscience burdening assaults that relate to our doubts and our fears, questions our sincerity, troubles our peace, but we lay hold to the shield of faith. John Stott, puts it like this. He says, faith lays hold of the promises of God in times of doubt and depression. And faith lays hold of the power of God in times of temptation. We cannot go into war without the shield of faith. Next, we're to take up the helmet of salvation. Friends, As we engage in this battle in this present evil age, we do so with the sure knowledge that our salvation has been secured. We know that both personally and eschatologically that Jesus has already won, right? We enter with a sure salvation. Charles Hodge wrote, that which adorns and protects the Christian, which enables him to hold up his head with confidence and joy is the fact that he is saved. We are secure in the heavenly places. And so we enter with the helmet of salvation, being reminded that even as we fight such a hard, close battle, that we do so from the standpoint of assured victory. And finally, we read of the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now the sword in view here, it's not the long broadsword that you know you would wield it's a smaller sword it's probably just a couple inches across and a couple of feet long and it's the kind of sword that you would use in close hand-to-hand combat where you just need a sharp instrument to wage war in what would inevitably be a very tumultuous battle The sword here is not just any sword, but it's the sword of the spirit. It's the word of God. As the author of Hebrews tells us, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Friends, to be at peace with God is to be at war with the spiritual powers of darkness, but God has graciously given us his word, both as a means to protect ourselves and to take 
ourselves on the offense to push back uh, <clears throat> against those spiritual forces of darkness by proclaiming the word of God into an unbelieving world who's held captive by the forces of darkness led by Satan. Like Christ in the desert, we use the word as our defense against the temptations of the evil one, but we also take the word and as a sharp sword, we proclaim it. Sure that it will not return void. And so if we ask, what time is it? Right? What time is it? We don't want to be the one who doesn't understand what time it is. Well, it's a time of war in this present evil age. And so we wage war right? with the right strategy against the right enemy and with the right weaponry. And as we fight, we wait the return of our triumphant king so that the church militant will become the church triumphant. When everything that he's already achieved will be worked out and made new in this present evil age. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that even as we fight, we fight knowing our victory is secure. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us in not leaving us to our own devices, but empowering us and giving us every weapon that we need. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to appropriate the power that you give us, to be strengthened by your might, to not rely on our, ourselves, but to fully rely on you. Father, we ask that you would do this so that Christ may be glorified through us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.